Welcome. Today we are at Local Nature Photography with Assistive Technology. My name is Carrie Winninger and I'm the Outreach Lead for the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. And we usually do our public events at the Osborne or Galbraith Preserves. And these are in um, Yorkville, uh, near Yorkville in Mendocino County or Pengrove um, in Sonoma County. But for this 2020-2021 school year, things are a little different. <laughs> so we're doing everything virtual. And we're really excited to help you all connect to nature in, in new ways and have people from all around the world sometimes even join um, and make it so that we all still understand that during this time, we can still learn to make a difference even during the pandemic, connect to each other. So before I let Jerry, Rick and Tony take it away, I just wanna tell you a little bit about what the center does uh, and how we can be a resource to you. So no matter who you are, if you're affiliated with the school or not, um, the center envisions a North Bay working together to find environmental solutions. And we invite you to get environmentally ready with us. So what we're doing is building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors of society, not just those that might traditionally be thought of as helping the environment. And we really wanna do this by, by providing firsthand understanding of our connection with the environment. And we wanna give you skill building experiences that result in sustainable solutions. And there are a lot of different ways you can get involved with us. You can engage in research. You can take one of our training programs. We have a naturalist program, a land management program, and these are also now virtual. Uh, we actually had someone join us from Hawaii this last semester in one of those programs. Um, you can learn about the virtual field collaboration, which is a, a brand new thing started in May. Um, it's with over 50 field stations worldwide due to a rapid grant from NSF to bring students um, the ability to learn from virtual field experiences during the pandemic. Uh, there's internships and jobs. We have, we have tons of data you can access. You could lead events like this. If you have a skill, please let me know if you wanna bring your expertise to the world. Um, you can partner with us on projects. We work with nonprofits, community members, governments, lots of things to do. So we just want you to know that if you have something that could help the environment, run it by me. <laughs> All right, now you are important in addressing the greatest environmental challenges in history. That's what it comes down to. Today, we're gonna to shed light on the profound connection to the environment and wildlife that many nature photographers enjoy, how that can make real change and how that is not accessible to us all equally. Rick and Jury Waller are the founders of Heartwork Accessible Nature Photography, working with people of all ages and disabilities who want to get out into nature and enjoy wildlife photography. And Tony Sauer is the former director of the California Department of Rehabilitation, where he served nearly 115,000 people with disabilities annually. So this is one of our local nature events. And what that means is we have part presentation, then instruction, then time for you to go out and actually do something. And then we come back and we all share how that went. Um, so today the activity is photography um, and we'll be given 20 minutes, uh, about an hour in to take some photographs. And we'll give you more information about that with, uh, with the presentation. Now, Rick and Jury have already led two events with us that were so successful and popular. And um, that's why they're still back and we love working with them. And I wanna make sure you know how to access those events too. So if you go to our website, which is maybe where you found this event, cei.sonoma.edu, you can click on our calendar. And then if you look at past events, there's a recording link for every event that has already taken place. Um, so you can look at one that they did in April, which is called Backyard Photography, and one that they did in September, which was Intermediate Backyard Photography. And I'll put those links in the chat. Well, lastly, some Zoom stuff. Uh, we wanna see your faces. I'm glad a lot of you chose to keep your videos on. That's great. We would love to see you. If you're not comfortable, that's fine too. You can turn those off. We do ask that you mute yourselves while uh, the presenters are speaking. And if you don't know how, I can do that for you. <laughs> um, and then at some point, we'll all ask you to turn that back on again. Now, as far as questions go, we're, we're have a kind of tight schedule. So what we're gonna do is ask you to type any questions that pop up during the presentation into your chat box, um, type in the question. And then when I find time, I'm gonna go ahead and be like, okay, Rick, here's some questions that people have had and that'll be a quicker way to answer them. Then at the end, we'll have some space where you, everyone can just talk out loud and ask questions and share. But please do keep questions coming during the presentation because we'll, we'll have time for that too. 
Alrighty, if there is any technical stuff you need, the chat is also a great place for that and I can help you. Um, but other than that, I am gonna let these fantastic presenters take it away. And just one question, do you have recording turned on? I do, thank you for checking. All right, <laughs> here we go. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Jerry Waller, my husband and business partner in crime, Rick Waller. And we have artwork photography um, it is the volunteer part of our nature photography business. And it's all about bringing people of all different backgrounds and abilities, um, economic status into nature to learn and enjoy nature photography on either their smartphone or a digital camera. So today we're going to um, look at accessibility and assistive technology. And before I do that, though, I'd like Tony to tell a few more things about himself and his background. Thanks, Jerry. Um, and, and as far as background goes, um, before I was the director of the Department of Rehabilitation, I ran a Center for Independent Living and an in-home supportive service public authority. Before that, I was a cabinet maker. And before that, a motorcycle racer. So um, I, I see Bonnie on the call, and I used to play wheelchair tennis. and various sports um, in the BORP area. And I've actually known Rick and Jury for 39 years. We met in Lama's class when our daughters were, before our oldest daughters were born. So we've been friends for a long time. Um, retired now, um, live in Grass Valley. And my wife and I do a lot of traveling. So I'm fortunate to um, take a lot of pictures and have some suggestions as we go today of where I like to go um, using a wheelchair to be able to get good pictures because we can't get everywhere. So that's about it. Thank you, Tony. So we're gonna move on to just a brief overview on why it's so important for everybody to get involved in climate change reduction and awareness and just saving our environment for future generations and for all of us to enjoy. So you're gonna see um, a few quotes come up. I'm gonna go ahead and read the quotes, not something I normally do, but because we may have people with vision impairments, I want them not to uh, miss out on the quotes. So independent living centers, um, Tony and I were involved in starting Freed in Grass Valley and I see Lake Cal um, and her center for independent living. And there may be some more of you involved in the centers. Independent living is not doing things by yourself. It is being in control of how things are done. And that's a quote from Judy with the disability rights um, programs from way back with um, Ed and a lot of the other folks that were involved in getting the independent uh, living uh, movement started. We all have a part to play. This is a quote from Rachel Carson Callus for Modern Environmental Movement and author of Silent Spring. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. This is from Pablo Picasso. There is only one way to look at things until someone shows us how to look at them with different eyes. I think that's important for every one of us. And about climate change, Don John Delaney, Maryland politician. Climate change is the environmental challenge of this generation and it is imperative that we act before it is too late. And then finally, um, from Allison Davis of Global Green Grants Fund. One in seven people in the world have some form of disability, but like women, indigenous communities, and other marginalized groups, they are routinely left out of conversations and action to protect rights to a clean and healthy environment. With the unique insights about their own situation and barriers, people with disabilities have important roles to play in proposing creative and relevant solutions 
to improve their communities and protect our shared planet. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Rick and Tony. As, as Rick gets ready here, it's interesting. As, I, as I'm looking out my window, I see our gardener pulling up and I'm sure I'm gonna have a weed eater to, or a blower to attend with. So <laughs> it won't interfere when I'm gonna talk. <laughs> great, ti great timing, of great course. timing. We're gonna start out with Tony's uh, images. Um, if you would like to, it's the same tree we had originally, if you'd like to explain where they are and why you photographed them. Sure. So this is um, Carpinteria State Beach in Carpinteria, which is just south of Santa Barbara County. Um, I think it's become famous a little bit because that's where Ellen DeGeneres lives. And there's a wonderful little boardwalk there near the campground. And we love this campground, um, partly because it's in town. It's on a beautiful, safe beach. They've got a nice, accessible boardwalk and they have a brewery at the campground. <laughs> So that's a, a big plus for us. Um, and I, I was just out one afternoon watching a sunset and I happened to be in the right spot. And this couple were there with the kids playing and the sun was just about to go down. So um, I, this I'm sure was with my iPhone, which most of my pictures are with my iPhone because I always have it with me. And I, I just, it's just handy and I quickly grab it. Do you know if you zoomed in on this or not? I did. I'm sure I did a little bit, at least a little bit, because I'm back about probably a hundred feet from those people. Yep. Okay. And the only issues with cell phones when you zoom in is they can't hold the detail quite as well. And you notice that shows up, it's kind of creative looking, but it shows up a little bit in the banding around the sun just because it can't oh. handle all of that change when it zooms in. But a great shot. You caught the moment. <laughs> and this actually, I believe, is at the same beach. That's my wife and our our dog Tula, who we lost last year. Um, she was a retired guide dog that we were fortunate to be able to adopt. So she retired with us um, seven mm -hmm. years ago, and that was the beach. And uh, just to capture them and the people that I love and get to spend a lot of time with, people and dog. <laughs> And Tony filled the whole frame. Your eye goes exactly where he wanted you to see. So that's important when you're doing photography. Okay, and this is happens to be our RV down at South Carlsbad State Beach. And it was one evening, um, all the adults were, uh, uh, well, all of us are adults, but um, parents um, were sitting outside by the campfire. It was the night before my niece's wedding. And you can't really see it in this, but she's right in the middle of the RV that all the cousins um, that are in their early 20s were in the RV sharing stories and talking about her wedding while we were outside uh, enjoying the campfire. And the moon was coming up and you can see the palm trees in the background. Um, and directly behind me is about a 60 foot cliff looking right out over the, um, the beach at Carlsbad. We just love this spot. And that's where... Uh, Rick and Tree, we're just talking. We're going to be there on January 10th for a couple of weeks. And this is a very hard shot. Did, do you remember if this was cell phone or your DSL? It was cell phone. It was because this, it was a it was a spur of the moment shot. Uh, um, this is a very hard shot to get and keep that kind of detail in, and it did it very well. Is Anthony Tesler with us today? If so, maybe he can be unmuted and say a couple words. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, Anthony. I see a lot of people I know. Um, uh, Lindy, my wife, and I were uh, walking at, around Spring Lake, which is uh, a really accessible trail uh, in Santa Rosa. And I, I saw those two trees, and it reminded me of uh, early California Impressionists. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to take a picture with my DSLR to see what would happen. And I was vaguely aware that I was framing the shot as one is supposed to do with nature shots to make it more interesting. And I did a better job of it than I thought. So <laughs> this is... Um, these are the kind of shots that I really resist taking. I, I like having some humor in my work. 
I like having it be a little bit edgy. And this is such the, the responses I got on digital me, on media was uh, lovely, but it is lovely, and I'm glad I took it. So in spite of myself, I took this picture. Thanks. <laughs> oh, one of the things that I did is I made sure that um, I dialed back. The one thing that is kind of edgy about this is I did not saturate any of the colors nor increase the contrast that much. I kept it soft looking. I don't know about you guys, but on uh, Facebook and Instagram, I'm seeing lots and lots of photos that are just pushed farther than I, I, I like with both saturation and uh, contrast. So I wanted this soft and impressionistic looking. Thanks. And, yeah, and I, I like this because of that. Um, nature people have a tendency, like, like Anthony said, to push the vibrance up so high and, and then saturate it so much that the colors they show you don't ever really appear in nature. And that drives me nuts. So I'm glad you yeah. go the other way. I do too. <laughs> Shooting birds and 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 nature, I almost always knock the contrast down because you get so much more detail and a much softer feeling out of it. I do have a tendency to kick up my vib vibrance when I want it in certain places, but right. this was perfect. Thank you. Thanks. And if you'd like to talk about your um, tripod. Well, one of the things I was finding with the regular tripod as a wheelchair user, power wheelchair user, is I can't get between the legs generally to be able to take a photograph. And so I somehow or other came across this uh, tripod where it can stick out to the side. And you got to be careful because with a heavy DSLR, it'll pull it over, but you can balance it out. And this has helped a lot. It's uh, it's not cheap. It's not lightweight, but um, I think I got it as a Christmas present. And I've looked at these a few times, thinking about how handy they can be, especially for doing flower photography. Oh you yeah, get down really really low with them, um, and it's easy. Usually, if you have your camera bag with you, you can always put it as the counterbalance on the other hand. Oh right, to help do that. I hadn't thought about that. Good idea. And oh. the, the actually, um, the legs are such that um, you can make them almost flat on the ground. So to, to do, there's a button there that you can see that you can push and the legs will go almost flat. And so you can be really great for macro photography. Yes, it's perfect for that stuff. And this is something that... Um, my first cameras I was using had those narrow little leather straps. This is back in the uh, 60s and 70s. And all cameras now seem to come these big wide nylon straps and they don't slide across my body. And so I've, I've been looking for narrow uh, uh, straps and I found Peak uh, manufacturer makes these narrow straps. And what's particularly nice is you see these little red things you can clip and unclip. I mean, you need a lot of hand strength. So for a quad, it wouldn't be good. But for a pair like myself, I can clip and unclip this real easily and put the camera strap across my body or take it on, take it off. Because, um, I mean, that camera was not cheap and I don't want to drop it. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for showing us, Tony. Anthony. Oh, um. I just noticed here that I've got a little uh, leash on my lens cap because I've lost three lens caps already. So yeah. I got this little <laughs> leash and it it helps. I, I have bought a lot of lens caps. <laughs> <laughs> the next photographer does, uh, is Brian York. Um, he's, he's in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Yeah. And he's not able to attend this morning. Uh, he does a lot of... Uh, fashion and people and a little bit of fine arts and you can look him up and find his website 
I'm just going to run through these kind of quickly just to show you the type of work he does. And then a shot of um, him and some of the equipment he uses. And this shot is to show he's one of the few people I know that uses a monopod. Uh, although I'm going to show one later that I think is, would, is a pretty good one if you have a disability because of how it stabilizes much better than monopods are not all that stable. They help a little bit, but not a lot. Okay, now we're gonna move into accessible trails. I'm gonna go back to Tony on this one because these are Tony's images and he was, he has the next couple of them, I think. Sure, yeah, this was um, actually this spring. Um, we were at McDowell Mountain Regional Park, um, which is in Maricopa County, just east of Scottsdale. And it's a beautiful um, Sonoran Desert Park. And we, we actually, pre-COVID, we left our RV there for a few weeks to come home to help babysit during tax season for my daughter. And our, our few weeks turned into about two and a half months. And we, so we went back a lot later than we were expecting, which was in the middle of May to pick up our RV and we got the cactus bloom. So this is um, just pictures I took again with my iPhone and um, the beautiful blooms and trying to crop things. And of course I probably have a hundred different pictures of these, but these are ones I thought were worth, worth showing to people. Um, this is Morro Bay recently. Uh, we were just there and which uh, for probably most people on the call, that's just a short drive down the coast. And um, there's an accessible walking trail that's listed in my resources that hopefully will get passed out. Um, this is our grand dog, Molly, that uh, we took with us. And this, we had been camping at that campground for a number of years when we didn't even realize there's this beautiful accessible hiking trail that thousands, probably tens of thousands of bird watchers come to every year. The bird sanctuary there is amazing. And again, um, actually, I think these were with my Canon camera, um, just taking in uh, the views uh, of, from the trail. Um, right over Molly's head in the smaller, in the picture with the boats behind it is the campground tucked away in the trees. And then the other way is looking out towards um, Los Osos, those way off the mountains is Los Osos. Um, so again, it's with my uh, Canon camera. And the stuff I'm going to show you next is actually out of a, um, it's called the Ultimate Guide to Accessible Hikes in, in America. The, the link is here. You can pick it back up again in the recording, but it's, a, uh, it's done by, Go, by Grit um, Chairs. So if you find Go Grit, you can find this. If you can't get back to this link. And Carrie, I wanted to thank, um, who's your friend who gave us that information? Well, her name is Mary, but she wasn't able to come today. Oh, well, please um, extend her gratitude for sharing that information with us. So there are many, there, they have it pretty much all 50 states listed in this. I just grabbed a couple that were not too far out of our area, like Crater Lake and the, the Godfrey Glen Trail, is, they'd say is fairly accessible. Yosemite, they quoted the Mirror Lake North Trail um, but also my shout of, of Half Dome is from Glacier Point, um, which is very accessible to get out to right to the edge and see Half Dome and sunset is by far the best time to get a shot of it. This was supposed to be sunset, but we got it just before and then the sunset ended up being clouds and we never saw it. So you grab what you can as you're going along. Uh, the Año Nuevo State Park with all of its um, elephant seals. They actually have a, um, a transit van that will take you from the entrance all the way out to the boardwalk trail at the point to see these. Um, this is one from us. We go to McCurker State Park a lot over in Fort Bragg. Um, they also have a boardwalk that takes you from the uh, beach parking lot uh, all the way out to where the seals are. This I was shot on a Nikon with a zoomed into about 
well, it's a 450 millimeter, but that's on my camera, it's a, almost a 650 millimeter shot. So it, they're out there a little ways, but you can capture them closer depending on what time you get there. I wanted to um, put out an invitation. If you have an accessible trail, um, California, any state, or out of the country to share, and you want to type that into chat if you haven't done so yet, that'd be great. And these are some other California parks, the Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park, and they're saying the Simpson Reed Trail is, is pretty accessible, and uh, Forest of, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, I guess it's Nesme, Mark State Park, multiple trails, Glacier National Park, the Running Eagle Falls Trail, so I'm kind of the Montana, Wyoming area, I picked a few up. Devil's Tower National Monument, we were just there, this is not my photo. Um, we were there earlier this year, walked the whole trail, it's pretty accessible, it was icier than heck when we were there. Um, it was late this uh, winter, early spring. And Rick, well, uh, it is, I, you can make it, but it is fairly steep in some places. And yeah, you're many, many years ago and many pounds ago, I wheeled around it in a manual chair. So it is accessible. Uh, probably 35 years ago, I did that and it's beautiful there. And then uh, Grand Tetons National <clears throat> Park. Um, both of these shots were not very far away from it. Um, they were both morning shots, not too much different in time. The upper right one is in um, Mormon Monroe Historic District where they have all these old buildings. And I loved how the way the cloud floated through the, the, the break between the mountains. And then the other cabin um, is a little bit up the uh, Gross Venture Road towards Lower Slide Lake, looking back down into Grand Tetons. Um, the, the the Mormon Row is very accessible, very flat. Uh, a lot of places in Grand Tetons is accessible, especially by the uh, dam in the uh, uh, Menor's Ferry Historic District. Um, this was the bottom one was a pretty much a pull off. You could photograph it right from the edge of the road. I walked down a little ways, but you didn't have to to get this shot. Yeah, the Tetons, if you're in that area, are just below Yosemite, or I'm sorry, Yellowstone, uh, below being geographically below, and, and the Tetons, I found them much more accessible state park than Yellowstone as far as yeah. getting around. And I'd have to agree with Tonya, even though it says they have multiple trails and they have all these accessible areas, the truly accessible areas are um, Mammoth Hot Springs with their boardwalks around the hot springs and the the geyser areas around Old Faithful and um, the Midway geyser areas, they have boardwalks. Tony can tell you what the They're marginal. Things they don't do, it's accessible. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> so, they, have, they have trails, but many of them say no wheelchairs. Um, although um, in my power chair, I was able to navigate most of them, uh, but I found Yellowstone this was probably four years ago to be not very accessible. Yeah, but they, they have work to do. Okay, move on to a uh, discussion about accessibility. I know we're pushing it a little late, but we'll make up for it. So I'm gonna turn this back over to three. <clears throat> Musical chairs. <laughs> Did anyone have accessible trails or nature areas that they wanted to recommend or they wanted to discuss how it's not accessible and needs to be. We did have um, somebody right in the chat. Uh, so Bonnie, who helped uh, before the event and gave us some information, just wrote that we can check out Access Northern California for more trails and that's www.accessnca.org. Um, and she also says, if anyone's interested in getting a free pro membership to the All Trails app, contact me at bonnie at warp.org. Oh, okay. And so they'll be in the chat for people to refer to, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, any other comments on places you've gone to that weren't too accessible or places you were delighted with? 
Tony, I got a question. Uh, is did the Freedom Trail burn? Uh, the Independence Trail, the Flume 28, which was the big flume, did burn. And there's a move um, to get it repaired. But it's probably going to be a while because of the cost. <laughs> it's funny. The, 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 my gardener just came in the, under the front porch to the blower <laughs> as I said that. <laughs> but um, the Independence Trail, yeah, back this summer uh, with, I uh, forget the name of the fire, it did burn Flume 28. And... Um, but the trail itself, you can still get on much of it uh, probably oh, in the spring. Well, it, it's closed right now, but in the spring. Right. And that that's is... by the Yuba River um, near North San Juan, Nevada City area. And it was the uh, first accessible trail that of its kind, I believe, in the United States. John Olmsted and a lot of the founders of Freed, like Tony and Sam Dardick were involved in creating that trail. Thanks for bringing that up, Anthony. Well, it's an amazing trail. I mean, I, I got to do the whole thing and was, uh, yeah. And actually John Olmsted's first accessible trail was up in Mendocino at Handy Woods, um, yeah. which is still there. And then he went on to do the Independence Trail and sadly we lost him. Yes, yes. I, I, I knew him, Bonnie, and thanks for bringing up about his other trail. That's a beautiful one when you're on the coast. And he was able to save that trail area and the beach just in the nick of time. They were um, clearing it or starting to clear it to build some kind of um, commercial property. I wanted to also mention that there's different types of accessibility. Um, we may have people that are involved in the class or will be watching the recording later that aren't um, using a wheelchair or a walker or other mobility devices, but have hearing uh, disabilities, uh, low vision, maybe they have uh, post-traumatic stress disabilities, and they need to look at accessibility as far as perhaps avoiding crowds or loud times of day. Um, they have different aspects to their needs that we need to take into consideration. So whenever heart work photography um, devises one of our outings, we try to ask people about their accessibility needs. Any other comments about accessibility, trails advocacy? I would just like to give shout outs to just our local, um, like Spring Lake, um, our DSLC support group, arts group, does a lot of, we've done a couple hikes out there. We've done some art things. They've got that great path all the way around. It isn't, you need power to go all the way around. Um, I don't, I couldn't do it manually in my chair, but um, that one and Dorn Beach, um, I just wheel the entire, they repave the entire road um, so, you know, cause they're little side, they do have a little walkway along the side, but I like the, the, the whole road. So I'll wheel the whole thing there. So yeah, those are two of my most accessible kind of favorite. I just add, I just added someone's on the Doran Beach Lake and they have that chair they give out for the sand for free. That if you're in a wheelchair and you can't get your wheelchair down into the sand, they actually have a sand chair that they give you out for free to, and I see I'm out there a lot and people use it a lot. It really is nice. So you can get right down to the beach. Oh, good, Susie. Thank you for that. And thank you, Lake. Uh, Susie, do they just have the one chair? Yes, they just have one. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm in Central California and we've got quite a bit as far as accessible trails around here. We've got um, numerous ponding basins in the Fresno Clovis area and trails going throughout Clovis. So there's several miles of accessible paved trails and um, a lot of the parks and ponding basins join up in areas. So you have parking areas close to a basin. And it's good if you're a birder, you can go and, and watch and photograph birds. Um, there's some really large ones. We get seabirds in here because we're on the Pacific Flyway. So you'll see a lot of pelicans and cormorants and little seabirds, terns, plovers, killdeers, still just, you know, depending on the time of year, 
and the water levels and if the ponding basins are marshy or if they're full. Uh, we have Canada geese, egrets, almost anything you can think of. Um, you get little migrating, the tiny little birds, the what do you call them, the warblers come through. We just, you know, you wouldn't think there would be that much here, but we have an, an awful lot. And then there's some bigger reserves and refuges. There are preserve areas that can be a little dicey. Some you can get around parts of the areas. And it depends on how mobile you are and how much you can tackle. And there's also oh, the San Luis Refuge area near Los Banos and the Merced Wildlife Refuge. Um, and they have drivable trails. So if you're able to drive a car or a van, you can go around the auto loops and there are places you can pull over and you can do photography from there. Um, there's some walkable areas uh, that you could probably tackle with your walker or if you had to use a cane, um, they're hard packed dirt trails. They can get a little rutted, so you'd have to be careful. And, um, oh, at Merced Wildlife Refuge, there's a photo blind. When you go around the auto loop there, there's a place to pull over and you can walk or wheel out into the photo blind area and it goes out into the marsh area so you can get closer to the wildlife there. Um, but even if you don't use that area, the auto loop takes you very close to all the all the areas where the birds are. We, we were able to get some pretty good photos there. Um, Piedras Blancas on the central coast has a boardwalk also out to where the elephant seals are. And this is a good time of year. They should be birthing around this time. So it might be pretty crowded. Excellent. Other central coast areas too. A lot of the beach areas, there's a lot of boardwalk areas and paved areas like Tony was talking about Morro Bay. There's a lot of accessible trail areas there and Cambria is good. And what is your name? I'm Barbara. I'm over in the Fresno area. Thank um, you very much, Barbara. And I, I don't have any disabilities myself, except for getting too old these days, but my husband has a disability. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, do you see the sandhill cranes? Oh, uh, yeah, oh. we did. When we were there, we were able to see a few, and then there were a lot of snow geese. There were just gazillion snow geese when we were there. <laughs> Barbara, I would love to see a list of some of those in Central Valley because whenever we're driving through there, I always think it'd be great to spend a couple days here, but I don't know what we would do. So it'd be great great to have a list of some of those trails. You're, you're welcome to stop by. My husband's an old DOR guy. <laughs> I just, this is Bonnie. I just put something in the chat that all of the trails that uh, Barbara mentioned are on the Wheeling Cal's Coast website. And I put that in the chat. Yeah, there's also, I don't know if anybody's heard of it, Audubon has a project going called Bird Ability. It's all one word. And um, they've developed some information things and they have a map and you can, if you know of accessible trail areas, this is, this is more focused on people interested in birding, but, you know, we're all kind of, you know, interested in very similar things. And you can enter your own information on the map. Um, Except it's down right now. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was just working on it a couple of days ago. It was working okay. Okay. Yeah, as of yesterday, it wasn't working. But uh, well, they'll get it going, I'm sure. Yeah, and there are also a tremendous amount of uh, birding spots in Northern California too. We go to them a lot, and this year it seems like it's going to be a real strong year for seeing a tremendous variety of, of birds. Um, okay. I'm going to move on just because I know I'm running a little late here. So, um, <clears throat> Bonnie, if you could chime in and talk about your your gorilla um, arm on your chair. Sure. Uh, this was developed um, as a part of a project through UC Berkeley to work with some um, engineering students. And my issue is that I'm a quad, so I can't hold the camera very steady and hit the button at the same time. So I mostly just use my cell phone and or my iPad. And I needed something that I could independently use. And so I just took the arm pad part of my armrest out 
and then this gorilla arm fits in the hole where that arm pad would normally slip in. And then it's kind of hard to see, but there's a plastic, a flat plastic piece attached at the end with Velcro. And so I had to put Velcro onto my iPad and could stick it onto that. And then the gorilla arm could was adjustable and bend. And, um, it wasn't super stable as I would be going down a trail. It would bounce around a lot. So I, I didn't keep my iPad on it. Uh, except for when I was trying to take a shot. Um, and I don't really use it all that much. And now I'm trying to work with a remote. I found a $7 remote that works with my iPhone. Um, so trying to do that, but still my issue is holding the camera steady enough to be able to get a good shot. Yeah, that's, that's always a challenge. Um, the, the latest versions of, of smartphones has very good um, image stabilization built into them anymore. And that's been, well, I'd say it's about two versions back through now. If you turn that on, especially for video, it really helps. But it helps also for um, stills. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, these are just a few images I, I picked up of uh, available equipment. Uh, one is similar to Bonnie's um, gorilla arm, except it's a different type of a flex, but it's a single unit. It's $160 on Amazon. And it's the only one, if you go in and say wheelchair camera clamp, it's the only one they even show. I haven't found any other ones. Um, it's $160, but if I went out and bought the pieces and put them together, it wouldn't be much less. So it's, then there's, it's reasonable, I think, for what it does. Then there's also the gorilla tripods that you can shape into anything for height um, and, and uh, flexible arms that uh, one of the early shots um, we had of Tony's, Tony's back, we had the arm hooked up on it, had a camera moment, mounted on it. Uh, next, um, this I actually showed in last class, but it's different switches you can use to, to trigger your camera. Um, the upper right one being a blow switch, the middle one a bite switch, and the lower one being a tongue switch. And a lot of this was created for um, skydivers. So if you go to skydiving um, um, equipment places, you can get it much cheaper than you can if you go to assistive technology places, like 10 times cheaper. So the switches are in the $40 range. I've seen as high as 400 on same switch on educational sites. Um, clamps for uh, making your own um, unit. So if you need something bigger, shorter, um, different varieties of flex arms, clamps for going around handlebars, frames, um, any kind of bracketing you might have on your chair for us. Uh, um, either DSLRs or action cameras. I'm going to talk about action cameras quickly because they are small and light. So they're easy to hold. They have the same size sensor as a cell phone. So the drawback is if you, and most of them you can't zoom in, you can change your angle, but they don't let you zoom. And if you zoom, it's a digital zoom, which kills your quality very quickly. So you're always better if you can take a still shot on a cell phone, take it at the wider angle, crop in later. You will actually get a better shot than if you crop in before you shoot. The, the quality will stay a little larger <clears throat> and tighter. So anyway, the, what I like about these, they have um, image stabilization built into them. They have voice commands and they shoot raw photos. And most people shoot JPEG, but as you get higher quality, you go to RAW, which means it captures all the detail. Um, with, we could talk about that more later. But um, and these are higher ends to the lower end, and they they're like three hundred and fifty dollars for the highest end, and they're about at a hundred dollars you can get the same quality, just not the brand names of GoPro and DJI, but the, you can still get very good cameras that are very easy to handle great for video. They're built for extremely rugged 
video shooting and a lot of vibration, their image stabilization will take out all that vibration. Um, there's a lot of accessories for them. I just had this image up because there was a clearance at Best Buy to buy a head strap for them and a suction cup for them and a sticky mount for them for $8.49. So you can get really cheap packages of action camera accessories for, I bought my pack that had like 50 different connections for like $28 off of Amazon. Not that I'm a great Amazon follower, but they, there's a lot of stuff. I also use B&H a lot. And I use Adorama a lot. Those are the two camera places I buy stuff from. I also buy a lot of rebuild equipment, like re, uh, refurbished equipment by the manufacturer. So I, I shoot Nikon. I My last three bodies have been refurbished bodies. Um, my lenses, I'm, I built, bought a couple refurbished. And now I'm paying a little bit more money and buying like the 200 to 500. I bought a straight Nikon without refurbished. I am not a big fan of monopods because the only, it still gets all your shake in it until I ran into this one. And I haven't used this. I haven't seen anybody use this. I just found that it exists. This is a monopod with a fluid base. So if you're a video a videographer, you have tripods that have fluid um, tripod heads and that creates a drag on them when you go to tilt or, or, or pan, which slows you down, doesn't let you jerk around as much. And they did build this into the foot of this one. So you can actually swivel this thing around in the different positions and the fluid will hold it steady in that area. So something worth checking out if that's something you're into. I've also seen a couple people with uh, chair users who have, uh, clamp these to their frame. So they have it there right in front of them. They can extend up and down move um, and, and have the monopod off the side. So it's mounted right to the frame. Um, gives you a little more height than maybe the, or, or I don't know if you're gonna gain lower, but a lot more height if you want to you get a higher shot. And if you're shooting with an app or a cell phone or your camera, cause you can get apps for both of them. Um, you can see what you can control it with your cell phone. Uh, then I wanted to talk about stabilizers. I There are many of these out. I happen to own this one, but many people make them. Um, um, Carrie was saying how good they are for them to go out when they're doing research to shoot videos. What these things do is they stabilize on three different axes. So pan, tilt, and any movement. You can literally run with these things and it will cut out, the, the vibration will be completely knocked out of the video. It's almost like you're looking at film with people with really expensive dollies running these things. You can also put it on a tripod. You can mount it to anything that is tripod mountable. It is great if you have trimmers, it takes all that away. Um, this one was on sale a couple minutes ago, I, excuse me, a few days ago for $89. It's, so it's in the hundred dollar range. It's not that expensive to really improve shooting photos with a, a smartphone. Um, cameras. I wanted to talk about this only because a cell phone camera has a very, very small sensor. If you go to zoom in, it's, it falls apart. It just can't handle it. The newer ones now, they've added three lenses, four lenses to them. They, combine all those lenses, which really helps the quality. But if you are shooting a single lens um, smartphone and you want to step up to something that's not all that heavy and not that, that much bigger, uh, these lenses use a one inch, uh, these cameras use a one inch sensor, which is just slightly smaller than what a crop sensor is on a DSLR. So the quality, the detail it can hold is tremendously better. These are not, and it's funny because I've been looking at Nikon, I've been looking at Canon, and I fell into the Panasonic Lumix, and because of their sensor and their lenses, they're using Leica lens on them, uh, and their zooming capability, um, this is what we're going to go, this is going to be Ree's next camera for, for shooting, so she doesn't have to shoot the cell phone all the time, because right now she shoots strictly cell phone. 
range from the, the point and shoot up to what's called a bridge camera, which is in the upper left. Um, they range anywhere from about $300. And if you got the really high end one, it's about a thousand. The one in the upper corner is about 450. It shoots out to 400 millimeters. They make one that shoots out to a thousand millimeters. So you have all that built into one camera that's fairly light, good sensor, um, good lens, um, great stability, um, and light and pretty lightweight. All and you don't have to interchange anything. And they're all controllable by cell phones apps. And then I just wanted to make you aware that there are remote controlled pan tilt heads that you can put on a tripod. So if you can't con hold your camera and you don't want to move your chair or whatever you're shooting as with or what your disability is, these will allow it with a remote to, to move your, your camera sideways or up and down. Um, and, and the video um, heads will also slow down because of the fluid that's in them. It, it makes you not be jerky. And the last thing I wanted to show you is that they also build stabilizers for DSLRs. They get rather more expensive because they have to carry a lot more weight. But they start in the about low, I've seen them as low as uh, upper, uh, right at 300 up to about $800. So if, if you need something like that, just know that you can get it for a DSLR. And then this is just an image of a, a gentleman um, in a chair um, using a lot of this stuff uh, to take, do his photography. And now to get you guys to go out and do some photography. Uh, is there any, anything we need to talk about that's popped up, Carrie, that we should address? There have been so many great recommendations from people. People oh, are wanting to make sure that this is going to be listed. So Rick, you are going to send a list of the resources that you mentioned, correct, to me? Yes. And then I can circulate that? Yes, I will do that. And any if anybody wants to send me any of the stuff they mentioned, you can send it to Rick at Heartwork photography.org and I will make sure it gets into the list because I'm really interested in this list too. When it's done, Carrie will have it. We will also put it up on heartworkphotography.org so you can get it to it at any time. Yeah, and the recording of this event will be posted so you can always just listen to it again as well. Um, and I'm happy to post, um, if we create a document with these resources, I'm, hope, I'm happy to post that at the same time. Yep, that'd be great. Get it as many places as we can get it, get it out there. <laughs> So thank you for all of, all of you who have, have suggested things. Anything you've suggested, please send it to me so we can work it into information for other people. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly go over some things that give you a little idea of, of, of to think about. We've covered this before. You can see it in our beginning class that we've done for SSU. I just wanted to cover quickly Composition, try to fill a frame. If you have a zoom lens, zoom in a little bit. If you have a zoom lens on a cell phone, try not to zoom in over 2x. It doesn't fall apart too much there, but after that, it gets pretty bad. Um, so try to fill um, the frame if you can. Detail, all this is because it's we're not the big greatest time for lighting, but Side lighting does a lot. Overcast does a lot for the more detail you can capture in an image. Make sure when you're photographing, the closest thing to your lens when it's got this kind of detail is in focus or almost in focus. You notice in my lower right, it's slightly out of focus, but the center is part sharp and it falls off again. If, if you kind of don't get towards the front sharp, people don't seem to like it too much. Um, simple, tight water droplets from Dew's Wonderful. If you have to fake it, use a mister with glycerin water and make your own water droplets. Leading lines to draw your eye in from 
to the spot that you want to get their eye. If you're shooting an animal and the, the spider webs like this pulls it back into the, the right to the spider. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere, our eye enters the photograph from the lower left-hand corner. So you want to control where their eye goes from there. Rule of thirds, just because it's an easy thing to remember, it's not, as you get more advanced, you, there are very many variations on this and, and spirals. There are all kinds of things. This one's easy to remember. Three lines horizontally, three lines, three sections horizontally, three sections vertically. Um, where the lines intersect, more, that's the best place to put your subject. Everybody starts out trying to put their subject right in the center where the little dot is on your phone. And everybody does that. So after a while, it looks like everybody else's photograph. So if you try to move eyes, subject, flower to those intersection points, it's more interesting. This is using rule of thirds where I felt this is a um, up in northern Canada is the 3 a.m. sunrise um, on a frozen lake, um, Bora, Bola Lake, Bola, Bora Lake, I can't remember right this minute. Um, and I wanted the stars, it's just seen that the stars and the little cloud up there was more important to me than lower, so I brought the horizon down. But always try to move your horizons down, down a third or up a third unless it's a perfect reflection and you want it right in the center. But it usually takes almost a perfect reflection to make it interesting in the center. And after all of that, don't forget to capture the moment. The moment's more important than anything. You can think of all the technology, but if you don't capture the moment where nothing is sharp in this image, my image of this elk, but it caught the moment. You don't, they usually don't walk out to the road, stick their tongue out at you and then walk back. But this one did. So, you know, capture the moment. Then if you have time to get better shots, give them, but get the moment. And now, yes. Yes, I just wanted to interject. Um, before you have a chance to do some photography, either from your porch, um, outside, maybe even from your window, the main um, progress that we're going to look at here is what works for you as far as assistive technology. Or if you're not a person who needs assistive technology, but perhaps you'd like to come on one of the outings where we have a wide variety of people with disabilities and people um, like our friends and family members that just want to hang out. You can think of, you know, what would it take to get down close to this angle? What would it take to um, study the camera for this shot? And you can come back with any questions, what works, what doesn't work. So if we can get you to take some photos, however that works for you, whether it's through a window, if that's the best for you at this moment, if it's out in your backyard, if it's uh, down the street a little ways, and if uh, you could come back and you, you feel like it, please upload one with the instructions that uh, Carrie had sent to you yesterday again. Um, and we will critique those when you get back. I will be here available for questions during this break anytime if you want to ask questions. And I did just put the Google Drive link in the chat so that it's convenient for everyone to find. If you've never uploaded anything to Google Drive, I included a couple screenshots to the email yesterday just to show you where to go, um, or you can hang on and ask us here. Um, and also, I think let's just give it an extra couple minutes. So if it's okay, I really wanted this portion to be enough time to feel like you had the time to actually go do something. Is it okay if we make this 15 minutes and cut into our Q&A since we've already had some discussion. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. All right, and I can make my wrap up a little quicker too. So why don't we give people a full 15 minutes right now? So that it's 11.03 in the Pacific time zone. I know some people might be other places. So we'll come back at Pacific time, 11.18. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Have fun. <laughs> Sometimes are helpful. Sometimes they just wait till you focus on them and fly away. So yeah, some of them are really, really active and they're very hard to get. And then oh, yes, they are. 
the bumbles will kind of stick around a little bit for you. And you shot this with what? What did you use as a camera? My iPhone. Okay. It's and it's an SE. I have an old one. Uh -huh. You know. And, um, yeah, it looks good. I mean, it. The, there's. I can't tell if it's really if it what type of camera it shot on because it held the detail well. I liked it because you were close. It, it knocked out the background. Uh, the B. The only way you can stop the B movement is just a higher shutter speed that you can force it to do with with your app. But that's about it. Uh, but it's great. I mean, it's it is very. And this is one that can be very centered too because everything else is making it work to be centered so symmetrical thank you great shot thank you and judith did you have any um, recommendations or questions about assistive technology i don't and i am still trying to figure it out i mean i basically point and shoot you know i don't know that much about the you know what is available on my iphone um in terms of fine-tuning photos and I haven't used any um, apps for editing or, you know, to modify the photo. I'm really interested in that, but I'm also kind of a techno dodo. So, okay. Um, you can, one of the apps that I use on phone and was recommended to me, to me by a guy that does all the reviews for Adobe for their products um, and writes courses for them is Snapseed. He uses it on his iPhone and he says he hardly ever uh, takes his images onto his computer. He just does all his editing on his iPhone now with his, with, with that app. He really wow. And can you put that in the chat? Yeah. Is it just Snapseed? Snap one word? Snapseed. S-N-A-P-S-E-E-D. Is it a dot com or is it just the, the app? I think you can just find it on both the Apple Store and uh, and on Google. It's for, they make it for both Android and iPhone. All right. Okay, I, if we move I, on to the next. I had someone else recommend that app as well. Yeah, and, and the Lightroom app is good too. Those are probably the two best ones out there and, and both of them are free. All right, next photo is, ooh, we have so many more now. Fantastic. <laughs> Who's this? So this is me. This is my um, ode to summer. It's like one of our little neighbor's last vestiges there. But I guess I, I'm i not that happy with it. I, I put up three. I'm sorry, I didn't realize we're supposed to do one with the time frame. But um, Which one of the three would you prefer? I, would, look at? I think I'd prefer, um, I like that one. Yeah, I do too. I like this one, yeah. I, I like it because you got all these leading lines kind of leading right into the center, right? Everything's drawing your eye right into the center area. And and it's just a design thing. It's nature, it's sky, and it's a design thing. And it's and the held detail and everything. It's a great shot. And the energy in it, yeah. it's, it's very energizing. Gets you excited. Now, after, after we're done, go out there and, and spritz it with a little water and shoot it and see what it, if you oh, with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. And I believe this is your third one. Yeah, okay. that was just, yeah. And I love that too. I'm always <laughs> shooting tree bark details yeah. tight like that, just to feel the different textures. Yeah, I love doing that stuff. Nice shot. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Who did bubble? That's me. Oh, I'm actually the Santa Rosa bubble lady. So usually I'm in the picture. I've been in oh. thousands of pictures, but this time I got to take the picture. So that's really I, cool. I would have yeah. never thought of that. Oh. And I'm sorry, who's speaking? I can't see because I'm a screen share. Susie. Great. I'm, I work with the lake. So <laughs> uh, I love it. I mean, it just, it, your eye instantly is captured by the bubbles, but you're seeing nature through the bubbles, which I guess we all see nature through our own little bubble. Yeah. So there's a on there. Susie, um, Susie is our AT coordinator at, at our independent oh, living center. So excellent. all of this information you provided is going to be really yes. helpful for us. Okay. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, when you have time, because I know that this was shoot and get it up so we could see it, 
crop a little bit over more into the right hand side. Okay. Um, just because I think if you isolate um, upper right hand side, getting some of the larger lower bubble, but not all of it, I think it focuses the eye in it a lot more. It won't let them wander over to the other two bubbles and kind of not be focused right on what you want. So crop see. the big bubble up on the right that's kind of blurry? Yeah, keep the big bubble in, up on the right. Keep the right hand, upper right hand side. Oh, okay. About, or the, somewhere down into the darker grass, but not all of the lower bubble. Okay. But that's, that's all I would do on it because the bubble is it. And okay, because I kind of wanted to make this my Christmas card because I'm kind of known as the bubble lady. So <laughs> thank and, you. And, I, and for the tree through the bubble being soft should be because it's a bubble. So right. perfect. Oh, Great thank job. you so much. You're welcome, Susie. Cicely. Yeah, this is my little uh, leaf bug doodad uh, sitting there. Um, I don't see them too often in my backyard, but uh, I took this earlier this morning and I just saw it kind of flutter onto there. And so I was like, oh, cool, like perfect. And so I just took the shot. Um, I meant to crop it a little bit more, but I think I forgot to do that. But other than that. Um, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think the crop would do it for you because it just pulls your attention right more into the bug and, and the blooms on the flower which is really the subject. Uh, and the fact that you have, you have when you crop, you'll have more dark background that pulls your eye even more into that center section. And, and I have a tendency not to put my stuff, everybody has their own style, but my, my style is not to put everything right in the center. So I, I would keep it vertical and I would offset, and I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't offset because the diagonal is already set there. So maybe just crop tight and leave it as it is and don't worry about an offset. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm also an artist and I, you know, paint and draw my pictures also, you know, as practice. Uh -huh. And so that, that's helpful advice. Yeah. Thank you. So tight is usually, you know, the thing I advise the most for everybody is you have the capability of somehow getting the shot you think you like get a little bit tighter on that shot and take it again and get tighter again and take it. Usually you'll, in the beginning, you'll like the second shot better. As you shoot more and more, you'll like the third shot better because the closer you get, the more interesting it really gets. Just got to make sure everything's sharp when you get closer. Next. Plants. Oh yes, there's nature. Oh, I love the colors in there. Really, I thought it looked a little washed out. <laughs> it is. That's one thing you can do with. Uh, you could. You, this is one that I would probably kick the saturation up a little. Well, the vibe. Okay, I use I use Lightroom a lot, so that's why I'm talking in these words. So, um, vibrance actually just in kicks up the color in the existing colors. So it doesn't really change the colors, it just makes them more vivid. And then saturation adds saturation that can shift the colors. So mm -hmm. I use a lot of, when I'm doing um, landscape shots like this, I use uh, the, the vibrancy and kick it up to about 25 or 30, which really doesn't change it, it just makes it um, more saturated, but the colors still stay pretty real. And the other trick I do is if you have the capability and most images will let you warm mm. up an image or cool it down, meaning cooler being more blue, warm being more uh, yellowish. So food shots, you always warm them. You will never see a food shot without, that's good, without being warm just because it looks more appetizing. But I would warm this and they do it in degrees Kelvin, I'd warm it about 500 degrees. But, but you know, on the other side, when Anthony Tesler was talking yep. about his shot yep. and the moodiness famous. of it and keeping it a little soft on, on purpose, I, I, I like it like that too. It definitely works the way it is. Just try the other thing and you will see if you like it or not. Yep. Can I yep. ask where you are, where this photo was taken? In my backyard in Berkeley. 
Berkeley. Yeah. I just had this memory. I used to live in Berkeley, so that's funny. But like, I see this and I'm like, I just get an emotion and a feeling and a place. And oh. I like the lighting, but I'm, I'm completely amateur. <laughs> and, and the nice thing about the lighting is it's not contrasty right now. So you see detail in everything. And that's always the problem of shooting this time of day if you don't have some overcast. Or clouds, overcast, right after the rain, wonderful time to do photography. Early morning, late evening, just after sunrise, just before sunset is the best lighting you're going to I hate to do it, but we have to whiz through the rest I know. of these. Sorry. <laughs> oh, love this. Just because it's, it is a design thing with wood in it too. So I, I just love it. I like the, Thanks, the way good. you cropped it. I love the wood that's in there. I, I mean, it's a great fine art shot. There's your edginess, Anthony. Well, that's, uh, so if you look at the next photo, I put two up. Here's my nature photo. Mm -hmm. Which didn't thrill me, but the the place the uh, the mat, I, I really kind of liked. So yeah, that you know a little edgy, a little bit of humor, you mm -hmm. know. My nature shot is repurposed flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> I w I would, you know, personal thing, but on the flower, the one that you had lower left, and and your style, my style, are probably very different. So, but. I would like to see that a little bit, if you could just brighten that up a little bit more so my eye popped in there and then played with it. I think it's a good idea. And I would, um, one of the things that, I mean, for me being a Lightroom user, one of the sliders that I like a lot is dehaze. Yes, me too. And so it's not like contrast, but it does make things a little bit pop a little bit more. And yeah, I... I was running out of time. I would spend some more time on this if I was going to post it. And I'd probably crop a little bit so I could bring that main flower down a little bit to the lower left. So uh -huh. it, it hits a third more. But yeah, I think you're right. I, I would. But there's a lot I, there to work with. Yeah, I like uh, localizing uh, uh, an area of the photo and then either, you know, boosting the contrast or, or bringing it down. But just that one, uh, one little area, and it, it that sometimes can really make a photo. It really can. Thanks I think we got through them all. Does anyone see their photo that we didn't get to? I think we did it. Okay. Well, we're only six minutes late. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to make my wrap up real quick, and then we can stay on for some other conversation if we'd like to. Um, so. Just really quick, I want to say a huge thank you, not just to Jerry and Rick and Tony who did all this work, but to everyone who helped. We had lots of people on this call that helped advertise and prepare and brainstorm and just, and the stuff you contributed today in the chat and out loud. So thank you all so much. I think this was such a success. Um, I do want to get back to my screen there. Um, if you haven't already, just let me know who your, your, your full name is. I'd like to keep the track of who is here today. Um, I want you to have my email address. So hopefully you all got my email and you can reply directly to that. It is winninga k w i n i n g e k at sonoma.edu. Thank you, Rick. Um, for any ideas, comments, questions, anything at all, just feel free and reach out to me. Um, also, just a few things about upcoming events. This is the second to last one of the season, so I don't have too much to say. Um, we have one December 12th uh, called the Winter Writing Walk. It's also a local nature, so we'll have time to go out, explore the same types of places you saw today, and do some sensory observations, and then create um, some writing. And it, it's very informal. It's up to you. It's led by a former SSU English professor, Lakin Khan, who's done two of these already. We've done one per season, and this is our third season. So I'm really excited about it. Um, and so you can find that on our calendar page. And a reminder that at cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar, if you go to past events, everything that's been virtual has been recorded, including the two that the Wallers have led previously in April and September. And that's where this will also be posted, this recording. Um, we do have a, a season lined up for spring that is very exciting. It's not announced yet, but um, you all will be on our, our email list for outreach events. So you'll get, you know, maybe two a semester. You can always unsubscribe if you want, but you'll get an announcement about our upcoming events in January. 
Um, and we are in talks maybe about doing a similar event like this for kids. So if you have any children that you know <laughs> or are related to or families that could use an event like this, then uh, keep that in mind when you hear the announcement. That's not 100% settled yet, but we're hoping it works out. Um, and then as part of our spring series, we'll have four events that are called Live from the Field that are pretty different. And I really just want to highlight them in case anybody knows um, any university or college faculty or students, because that's really what these events are made for. It's about bringing researchers from around the world, literally, uh, to talk about a topic at their field site, and then all come and have a Q&A about it with students as part of their college classroom experience during the pandemic when they can't be in person. Um, so these are really special. It's an NSF funded project, and we're really trying to get the word out about that. So other than that, I just want to encourage you to spread the word because these can be attended anywhere virtually, right? Um, recordings can be shared. And we really do want your input, whether it's about this event or future events. Um, so thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate the really engaged attitude you all had today. <laughs> um, and we'll stay on a little bit longer in case um, you have more questions or anyone wants to talk further. Thank you, Carrie. I just want to thank Rick and Jerry and Carrie for putting really? it together. It's awesome. And this was this great. very cool. This excellent AT information. Thank you so much. Excellent. I'm mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you would guys would be open to socially distanced um, uh, hikes or something that we could do the same thing. Um, we are. We are. Um, yeah, I would I would be fully supportive of that. We've that done be that cool. with ESLC, some socially distance outside. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, this spring is a good time. In fact, if we're going to do something like that, we should probably start planning it now and um, probably plan on a small group because of course. we'll have to still be careful. But mm -hmm. I would love to do that. Good. That Unfortunately, from a university perspective, our preserves are still closed. Um, so right. we wouldn't be able to do anything on site. So it would probably be something that you'd want to arrange outside of the Center for Environmental Inquiry, maybe with some some of you. But I, I don't think at this point the university would be able to get involved in that. But thank you for the idea. Thanks. And I'll know once it is possible that you're interested. <laughs> yeah. yes. A great place lake may be up there in the that's, spring. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Spring Lake, Armstrong Woods, Susie had mentioned, and Laguna de Santa Rosa is a really good place for birds. Where at? Laguna de Santa Rosa. Oh, yes. right. 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 Yeah, and that's really flat. And very close to yeah. um, the Osborne Preserve is Crane Creek Regional Park. Is that accessible? Yeah. It, 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 it's not a great park, kind though, of. For, <laughs> for what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's also Dorn, which we've, uh, Bonnie led a uh, walk, a uh, hike out there, and that's a great, lots of opportunities. Well, let's be in touch late because I definitely Absolutely. be interested in helping. Yeah, no, and, and we might be able Bonnie's to help. Bonnie's website, I just want to, you know, uh, I think that was put down into the link there. This is all accessible, you know, camping spots and hiking spots. Bonnie's got Northern California really dialed in. Yeah, um, I just want to know. Like, great Thank, stuff. You. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, yeah, and we may be able to provide some socially distanced transportation, you know, in the spring, so. Oh, cool. great. Might be an option. Uh, I remember when we were working to have the event at one of our preserves, that was a big challenge. Yes. Yes. Transportation. So yes. maybe I can talk to you later, Bonnie, when we are able to do this at the preserve. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful. Yeah. So glad you. to hear. Thanks. Glad Thank you could you. join us, Susie. It was, yeah. it was, every time we put one of these together, we learn a lot more at a lot different angles. So I'm always excited. To, it's something you to may put want these to together consider. because as I'm doing it, it just keeps growing and keeps yeah. growing. <laughs> it keeps growing as you can see because we couldn't make it on time today. Um, Thanks for your want... advice too, Rick. I, I took about a hundred pictures of bees a couple of weeks ago. So yes. now I have a all of a sudden, I got into taking pictures of bees and flowers because I grow hundreds of flowers. And oh wow. So uh, thanks for your advice. Now I know how to take a better one. <laughs> also, Rick, I want to thank you. I have never taken a photo where I 
open it up now, you know, with all my cell phone. I've never Uh done that. I've learned. And yes, afterwards I can blow it up and I've got all that clarity and stuff. So thank you. That was a great takeaway from your last class. It makes a big difference. And and I've I've played with auxiliary lenses, stuff that was supposed to be really good and they aren't. I played with cheap lenses at 2X cheap lenses. They're pretty darn good for like 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the only really good lens that I know of for cell phones is Moments lenses. They're about $100 a piece, but they are really good glass. And they, they make one that goes out to, I think, a 3X or a 4X. So you can get that, that sharpness on it. Uh, and they make a case so it literally hooks to that case. Plus, they also do clips, but they are the only thing, and I haven't been willing to spend that money yet until I buy my next phone. Right. <laughs> Rick, can I ask, you had shown a slide of the tiny camera that you said is good, but yeah. I don't think it's digital, correct? Is that? Oh, they're all digital, yes. They're all digital, okay. Yes, they're all digital. I, I'm going to pop right back to it. So yeah. these are all digital. They're all designed primarily as video cameras. Okay. But they take stills, and I only put up those that will actually shoot raw. Versus does does anybody need a definition of what raw is versus JPEG? I do. Please. <laughs> JPEG is what you usually photograph on most cameras. That is the default setting on a camera when you buy it. You have the what it is is a when it saves the image, it compresses out information. It doesn't feel it needs to make a, pre- a pleasant photo. And the, the people that judged that were, when they created that, when they created JPEGs, were professional um, portrait photographers. So skin is usually pretty good in those shots. But it does throw away a lot of information. And that's why when you save them, they not don't occupy a lot of space. Raw takes everything, all the data that hits the sensor, raw saves it all. So you have a lot more detail and, and, and highlights, shadows, whites, you have a little more detail, and blacks, you have a lot more detail. So you can, you can massage a lot more out without getting um, uh, noise in your image. Although it takes a lot more storage space because if you have a 10 megapixel image, it takes 30 megapixels to save it. Where it only takes about three on a JPEG. So you just buy bigger cards. I mean, what the heck? Cards are cheap and they're <laughs> really cheap. But I I have a I like the um, DJI Osmos, excuse me. <clears throat> but this camera they have out right now is not as good as the GoPro. The GoPro actually beats it in quality, but their next camera is supposed to be astounding. They're trying to take over the business from GoPro. Uh, the other one is um, uh, YI makes the 4KI. YIs, most of those are really good cameras. Um, and like I said, they take they take um, a lot of voice commands. So you can have them mounted on your head and talk to them. Scuba diving, snorkeling, Without a case, these are good. The the Osmo and the GoPros are good to about 35 feet in depth. Um, if you buy their cases, they're good down to about 100 to 120 feet in depth. So there's and, another part of nature that we don't talk about much at these events. Yep, <laughs> Underwater. And, and I forgot. <laughs> Reese says, make sure you put in a snorkeling shot, and I forgot to do it. Uh, her her sister and brother-in-law are avid scuba divers and they just have some amazing underwater photographs. Well, are there any other questions or comments before we wrap up? I, I have a request. Um, if anybody comes across other AT for cameras or related um, nature activities, please let us know. Just, you know, send us an email um, at um, it's it's heartworkphotography.org or um, yes, if one thing we're looking at for the future and I know we're all 
you know, in the same sort of advocacy and independent movement uh, professions. It, we're looking for engineering departments or IT departments that will develop real specific equipment for photography or getting out into nature um, and being able to make it affordable. I mean, so much of the AT now is just so expensive, unless you know how to make your own or, or you know, another way of acquiring it. So yeah, keep us informed if you run across anyone who, or a department that would be interested in helping with that. Great, yes. And I just wanted to let you know that the links on our, this last slide that's up, heartworkphotography.org is our main website. And you can get to the other website from there. And our portfolio is sitting on Heartwork Photography. It's more than the second link. So. And I do have the um, heartworkphotography.org in the chat if you want to copy and paste it. Easy. Okay. And Thank there's you. so many positive comments from everyone I didn't read. But Jury and Rick and Tony, everyone had really a, a great time today. So one more thank you to you all for making this. I know you put your heart and soul into these events. So I really appreciate that, the time and the effort. I love I love doing this. It just excites me. I love photography so much. And I love being with people out doing photography. So hopefully we'll all get together at some point and do that. Yeah. Oh, I hope everybody feels more empowered to experience nature and photograph it and maybe make a difference with it. Um, and I'm going to say adieu. Thank you all so much for attending today. Thank, thank you, Carrie. You. Thank you, Carrie, for making this happen. Take oh, care. Thank you, guys. It was fun. Margie. Bye, Kurt. Bye. Bye. Guys, stay Thank safe so there in Wisconsin. Yep, we'll try. We'll make do. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thanks for letting me join you. Oh, yeah. so great to have you, Tony. Right. Thanks. I it a lot. It was really nice. Thank you. All right. We'll be, we'll be in touch about following up with uh, resources and things, okay? Sounds perfect. Thanks, y'all. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.